The Immigrant and the Outbreak Narrative Understanding Why Immigrants Are More Susceptible to COVID-19 A Special Report by Zain Malik for Canadian Immigration News A study into the impact of COVID-19 by Statistics Canada has found that immigrants are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. The special report by Canadian Immigration News investigates what causes this impact and looks to analyze how immigrants are portrayed in the outbreak narrative. Immigrants have been subjected to stereotypes throughout the coverage of the pandemic. This report also highlights the role an outbreak narrative has in shaping the collective imagination of immigrants in Canadian society. Their portrayal can perpetuate harmful misconceptions, which can be detrimental to their goal of assimilation, and depict immigrants to be a threat to themselves and to wider society. This discussion will revolve around Dr. Priscilla Wald's book, Contagious, Cultures, Carriers and the Outbreak Narrative, and Dr. Edward Noon's report, COVID-19 Deaths Among Immigrants, Evidence from the Early Months of the Pandemic. The report emphasized that 25% of the deaths from COVID-19 in the early months were of immigrants, who landed in Canada between 1952 and 2018. The same population made up 22% of the total Canadian population. For expert commentary on the topic, we are joined by Dr. Priscilla Wald, author and professor of English, Gender, Sexuality and Feminist Studies at Duke University. We are also joined by Dr. Edward Noon, Senior Analyst, Health Analysis Division, Statistics Canada, who focuses on immigrant health and health services research. Canada. Good afternoon, Dr. Wald, Dr. Edward. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. having me. All right, so uh, this uh, discussion is being conducted in light of Dr. Edward's recent report for Statistics Canada, which found that immigrants are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Uh, the report lists multi-generation households, low income, overcrowded dwellings, and a lack of health literacy as amongst the causes for the disproportionate impact. The objective of our discussion is to highlight the role the outbreak narrative, medicalized nativism, and news framing uh, depicts in immigrants as a risk to themselves and to wider society. So let's begin with you, Dr. Wald. What is the outbreak narrative and how does it shape our collective imagination of communicable disease? Since uh, globalization has essentially been identified as a primary cause of disease, is it plausible to assume that in the coming years, the whole idea of immigration will be reimagined? How much of a threat do you think an impending existential crisis caused by communicable disease is to our understanding of immigration today? Yeah, those are great questions. So to begin with, um, the outbreak narrative is the name I give to a particularly um, set of conventions that I think became um, consolidated. So uh, lingu language, ter rhetorical terms, uh, visual images, plot lines that I think became really conventionalized in the mid 19th century, uh, sorry, in the mid 1990s as a way to talk about disease emergence. and. Um, this came out of a 1989 conference that um, was convened by medical professionals, epidemiologists, public health officials um, to uh, talk about and, and understand a con the concept that they coined, that they termed emerging viruses. And what they saw and what they tried to communicate was um, that this new these emerging viruses, these things to which there was no um, herd immunity. So things like HIV AIDS, um, Ebola, Marburg, hemorrhagic, Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, things like that, um, that were really catastrophic and potentially species threatening, that, that these were the result of globalization and development practices in two ways. On one hand, the world was shrinking Drinking and people and goods were moving much more rapidly around the world and, and coming into contact much more quickly. And on the other hand, the population was growing and people were moving into places um, that were then being developed that, um, that human beings hadn't lived in before and were encountering microbes to which we were all immunologically naive. We didn't have any kind of immunity. And so what they said is you can't think about these these um, diseases as uh, just in terms of um, medicine and science, we really need to think of them as social problems and geopolitical problems. We need to address our development practices, the way we inhabit the world. What I then look at is how a set of conventions that emerged from their scientific publications entered the mainstream media through uh, journalism, 
um, and then ultimately popular fiction and film. And it was in that process that it picked up a lot of biases um, and, and a set of assumptions that turned it into this thing that I call the outbreak narrative. And what? it's represented, to my last point, it's, sorry, it's represented by, for instance, the 1995 uh, Wolfgang Peterson film, Outbreak. That's a classic example of it. So uh, just, just to continue on, on the last bit of the question, Dr. Wald, how does the outbreak narrative, how do you see the outbreak narrative impacting the idea and perception of immigration? Ah, yes, thank you. Um, so there are a set of biases that are implicit to this narrative, and one of them is geographic, the idea that the threat is emerging from the global south and threatening the global north. And another is that expertise is moving in the other direction from the global north to the global south. Neither of those is historically accurate, but that is one of the conventions of the outbreak narrative. And one of the effects of it is to stigmatize and pathologize certain places and populations coming from those places. So in the US imaginary in the mid 1990s, it was especially Africa, although as the century went on and, and the turn of the century came with the previous SARS um, pandemic, for example, um, it was also Asia. Um, in the British versions of this, Asia was always there. So I think a lot of it is about um, prior colonized uh, areas um, and who had done the colonizing and what populations were particularly um, abject in particular places. And so the way it affects immigrants is that certain immigrants get represented through these narratives as fundamentally dangerous, both in terms of, I mean, both in political terms. So this also ends up picking up on um, the language of terrorism. So both in political terms, but also very explicitly in medical terms, that people coming from the global South in particular are bringing diseases with them, just as at the turn of the 20th century, uh, immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe were seen as diseased in a way that immigrants coming from say Northern and Western Europe were not to the US. I'm talking specifically now about the US. But I think it's it pertains in Canada in, in uh, um, similar ways. Definitely. So that brings us to Dr. Edward. Dr. Edward, uh, why do you think the pandemic has disproportionately impacted certain population subgroups, especially immigrants? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, in fact, um, the Public Health Agency of Canada has released a report last year uh, talking about uh, social inequity. And uh, they have uh, stated that um, inequity uh, situation has um, been persistent in Canada. So groups have dif differential access to resources uh, like income and education. So that's why like, um, uh, they think that um, uh, uh, the, the pandemic actually amplified this kind of uh, inequity uh, in resources. Uh, so the pandemic, um, yeah, like exposed the the kind of cracks that are uh, pre-existing in the society. Mm -hmm. So immigrants is an, uh, an example, um, like uh, because especially recent immigrants, they, it, it, it takes time for them to integrate into the society uh, to, to, um, to be able to find uh, more secure jobs. So that's why like, uh, especially the recent immigrants can be more adversely affected. Uh, but I must say that uh, it's not in terms of uh, mortality, but more in terms of infection. Uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, actually killed um, uh, disproportionately more older population. Mm -hmm. So as you've uh, mentioned, Dr. Uh, Edward, that uh, it takes time for immigrants to kind of assimilate and integrate into their host country. For instance, immigrants coming into Canada will require a degree of education in terms of their new country. So what, uh, in terms of education, what is the idea of health literacy? Why is it important? And why do you feel that it is a lack of health literacy is uh, detrimental to the cause of immigrants? And uh, why does it impact the severity of the effects of COVID-19? Okay, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, health literacy is defined as uh, one's ability to access, understand and apply the health information one, um, uh, one can potentially have uh, to maintain or to improve one's health. Uh, 
Um, and in my previous studies, I found that um, immigrants, uh, especially recent immigrants or immigrants who didn't have the um, official uh, uh, language proficiency, like in Canada, it would be English or French, um, uh, they are more likely to have lower uh, level of health literacy. And uh, as uh, the, um, the term um, reflects, like it, um, health literacy reflects one's ability to access, understand and, and use the health information. So in, in times of a pandemic, uh, and there are lots of um, public health um, uh, instructions and uh, requirements, and so that's why like uh, it, it sometimes it's very confusing for uh, uh, people, especially for immigrants who may not have the, uh, the language proficiency. Uh, so that's why uh, health literacy can be an important factor. Um, and if I can uh, go further, uh, uh, health literacy is more an individual level measure, but I'm glad that uh, if you look at um, healthy uh, Americans, uh, healthy people uh, 2030, in, in the US, uh, they, they have um, a look at, uh, they, they are moving the uh, health literacy concept beyond individual. They are looking at clinicians and also the organizations. Uh, are clinicians and um, uh, organizations able to help the, uh, the, the, the population to, to assess, to understand and to apply the, the concepts, uh, the, the information uh, to, to maintain or improve health. So uh, further um, development of this uh, measure would, would be very interesting and very good. Thank you. So coming back to Dr. Wald. Dr. Wald, as you can see, as Dr. Edward has rightly pointed out, the health literacy is essential in terms of developing an understanding of communicable disease and to eventually combat that disease. My question to you is, is there a degree of Eurocentrism in, in, in the said health literacy? Does health literacy and medical paternalism and health literacy go hand in hand? And there are many instances where cultural practices come into conflict with the idea of health. So what should be prioritized and how should we mitigate the threat by preaching health literacy? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, I think that on the one hand, um, I agree that there is uh, that health literacy all around is a good thing. If you think just in abstract terms of understanding uh, what health is, what you know, where diseases come from, and so on, um, that can actually combat some of the biases that I was talking about. But I also think health literacy could become um, a kind of watchword that. Um, What's the word that kind of undermines alternative cultural practices um, for health? So, um, for instance, in the global north, there's a lot of emphasis on technology, but uh, there are um, a lot of cultures in the global south, and these are you know not ideal terms, but I think there's a you know basic sense here um, that uh, there are a lot of practices that are not. Um, emphasizing technology that are actually much healthier, much um, more beneficial to human bodies and to the environment and a deeper understanding of the relationship of human bodies to the environment. So, you know, that's also health literacy. Finally, and I think this is really important, um, it is very easy to look at cultural practices and call them unhealthy. And that's another way of stigmatizing practices that are not at all unhealthy, that are not at all where the problem is, that are registering particular kinds of biases. And there's also another phenomenon where cultures are described, and I'm, I'm thinking now of a, something I read about a 2003 Newsweek article about the previous SARS pandemic, where there was an image of Guangzhou and a, a farm on Guangzhou, and the caption said, um, people live cheek by jowls with their animals, and this is productive of disease, and they're juxtaposed with this modern city, and this is how pandemics happen, when in fact this was not an image, and it was called, they were called primitive, they were described as primitive, when this is not um, a, a question of primitive and of people not knowing better and thinking that it's a good thing to live, quote, cheek by jowls with your animals, this was an image of poverty, of people who didn't have any choice. And poverty doesn't emanate in the global south. You know, if you think about global poverty, what are the biggest sources of our wealth discrepancies? You know, there are corporations and geopolitics that emanating 
among elite in both the global north and the global south, but I think the global north bears more of the responsibility there um, uh, in general, and certainly more than the people inhabiting these farms. So, you know, one of the things that um, this idea of health literacy, I think, risks doing is allowing a government or um, some other uh, organization to say, you know, you are in violation of these practices and you need our help and you need our instruction and you need to conform to this particular way of doing things without actually understanding where these practices are actually coming from and how they in fact um, could, could be productively changed with uh, wealth distribution, with um, uh, you know, helping people uh, with arable land, with, well, you know, lots and lots and lots of things. It, too, too complicated to go into. Yep, yep. So uh, I think so there is that danger. On the point of poverty and uh, low income, I'd like to address this question to uh, Dr. Edward. Listed multi-generation households, low income and overcrowded crowded dwellings as amongst the reasons why this disproportionate impact affects immigrants. How do these causes perpetuate the stereotype of the immigrant? Uh, I think at the beginning of the article, I just uh, um, uh, tried to set the state, uh, stage um, for the potential causes of uh, um, the, um, the study, uh, whether immigrants are disproportionately affected by COVID or not. So uh, this is just a preliminary uh, study. And uh, so we need further analysis to, um, to, to find out exactly the causes of uh, the uh, disproportionate uh, impact of uh, COVID on immigrants. And in fact, as I said, um, uh, this first wave disproportionately affect the, the, the elderly. So, um, uh, so it's under 65 uh, population that we see that uh, there are more immigrants uh, disproportionately dying of COVID. So I found that uh, especially like, so uh, among uh, uh, people age 65 and below, uh, whereas uh, the COVID deaths with, uh, as 30%, uh, uh, the, the same population is only 20%. So immigrants are, are disproportionately dying of COVID uh, compared to its share of the population. Uh, so, um, so, but, but uh, why is this the case? So we, we don't know, but it's possible that um, uh, immigrants, especially the recent immigrants, they are more likely to be uh, engaged in frontline work um, and maybe living in the multi-generational household. So this, these are uh, some of the um, uh, evidences that, uh, 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 that, that the research found. Uh, so, um, uh, but, but in fact, um, not all immigrants uh, are living in those situations. Um, and uh, so we, we know that um, more than 50% of the immigrants in Canada came in as uh, economic class, and they are more likely to be uh, well-to-do. Um, and so, uh, but it's, it's, it's may, it may be like in further study, we may find that it's only a small proportion like who, who, um, who, who had to be working in frontline job, but they are disproportionately uh, more exposed to the, the, the disease and they, they are more likely to be infected. So, so uh, stay could on I, that point. Could I add, um, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Could I just add very quickly, in the US context, and I'd be surprised if it were not also true in Canada, I believe it is, um, we also need to think about race. And um, non-white populations were disproportionately affected both in terms of mortality and morbidity. So, you know, one question I have is, you know, how many, you know, what is the, the overlap between an immigrant population and a non-white population? And I do think obviously economics has a lot to do with that because these are also uh, correlate with economically um, disadvantaged populations. So I think, you know, yeah. I think we really need to name race as the factor here yeah. and racism. Yeah, but uh, the, the, the challenge, uh, the, the uh, yeah, for Canada, actually, um, mortality, COVID deaths is much higher in the U.S. than in Canada, and uh, in 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 our first wave, uh, which is uh, more likely um, from March, from March to uh, August, uh, like um, more than ninety percent of the deaths are uh, age sixty-five and above. Mm -hmm. So only ten percent are under sixty-five. And uh, so my study found that uh, overwhelmingly uh, the immigrants who died 
uh, from uh, European sources, like the, the people from the US and, and from Europe, uh, people from Asia, uh, the, the, the proportion is much lower, like it's only about um, under 20%. Mm -hmm. So recent immigrants are less likely to be impacted. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it remains to be seen, uh, like it's to be seen in the future, like in waves two and wave three, uh, as um, I think in wave three, uh, a lot more younger people died uh, because uh, the older population are more protected partly through vaccination. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so race, uh, if you look at race uh, among immigrants, it's more likely to establish uh, European and American uh, 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 origin uh, immigrant who, who died. So it's interesting. Because, uh, it's, uh, the, 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 it's a long-term care that became the, um, the battleground for COVID in Canada. Yeah, that makes sense. And that, I, that I do think of, it's... That kind of brings, brings me to the point and realization where the blanket term immigrants is kind of homogenized. It is one fits all term that is used for everyone who's coming uh, from abroad. Or So uh, how do you think that the term immigrant is problematic, especially in terms of Dr. Edward, do you think it's problematic, especially in terms of collecting statistics and doing an analysis? Oh, like immigrant is a, like from, from my standpoint, it's a legal um, status. Uh, like um, we use the longitudinal land, uh, immigration database to link uh, to the, um, the, 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 the provisional death database. So, like, uh, so we we look at uh, whether the person has landed in Canada. In fact, our database also has temporary residents, like uh, temporary foreign workers or international students, or, and, and also refugee claimants. So, uh, future study that that can include that. And um, yeah, I have proposed such a study to compare wave one, wave two, and hopefully wave three. Um, but uh, of course, uh, like. Uh, so, for, but within this immigration population, uh, I have the admission class, so I know whether they are economic class, they are family reunification class, or if they are refugees. And so if you look at my article, um, it does say that uh, the majority of those who died came in as um, a family class, family reunification class. So many of them are older uh, and uh, more established immigrants. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and I also have uh, their recency of arrival. So when did they arrive? And majority of them came in before 1980. Uh, maybe half of them uh, who died uh, came in before 1980. Mm -hmm. And very few, uh, like I think under 10% are recent immigrants. So like, as I said, I think more uh, recent immigrants are more likely to be uh, infected, but uh, because uh, this uh, disease um, uh, um, uh, kill people who are older, so that's why there's a discrepancy here. So sticking with our theme of uh, stereotypes and archetypes, Dr. Walt, could you tell us a little more about typhoid Mary and the legacy the story has left on the perception of immigrants as a threat to a healthy Western society? Uh, yes. Um, so typhoid Mary uh, was the name given to a woman, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's pronounced Mary Mellon or Mary Malone, um, but she was an Irish immigrant who worked as a cook in, a, in several families. And um, she was the first identified healthy carrier of typhoid in the US. And the public health officer who identified her, George Soper, uh, was, was working to demonstrate a theory, what was just a theory at that time that people who had never been ill um, and who weren't ill at the time could still be carrying a disease that they could transmit. And um, there were, so he identified this woman, he went to her, he said, we believe that you're carrying this disease. This woman said, you know, I mean, imagine being told that. Imagine being told there's just a theory, it's in the medical community, it's not widely known or accepted, it goes against what everybody has believed up until this time. And he's saying to her, you are carrying typhoid, you need to stop working, we want to remove your gallbladder. We want to figure this out. And you can imagine the, you know, this woman rationally says you're crazy. Um, you know, who wants to accept that they have made people sick, that they've been working for, um, that they can't cook and, um, you know, have a livelihood that they're going to have all these medical procedures done to them when none of this is making any sense uh, to them or to a lot of people. Um, he ultimately said to her, if you cooperate with me, 
I will tell your story very favorably. I'll portray you in this very positive light. If you don't, I'm going to make your name a watchword. I'm going to make you look really bad. And she didn't. And he did. Um, he was not the person who coined the term typhoid Mary. That was someone else. But he certainly um, popularized it and publicized it. Now, one of the things I think is really important to understand here is in, in addition to the fact that she acted reasonably, despite the narrative that has been handed down and, and the, um, you know, the way that, that the things that, that that term connotes, typhoid Mary connotes, um, it's also the case that there were several white male dairy farmers who, because of their profession, because um, typhoid is spread very readily in fluids and especially in things like milk, um, were also spreading typhoid and in fact, were spreading it much more efficiently than Mary Mellon was, none of them received the treatment that she did, either in terms of being pulled into a story like this or uh, what ultimately happened to her was that they isolated her in a hospital on North Brother Island off Manhattan and she spent the rest of her life there um, because they couldn't quote, cure her. Um, that did not happen to these men. They were also told to stop working. They didn't, but the same thing didn't happen to them, which I think is very much because she was an immigrant, she was a domestic servant, and she was a woman. Um, so, uh, and all of those things are the case. She became the paradigm of um, the uh, dangerous immigrant that, that spreads disease, that doesn't, isn't disciplinable, and that poses a threat to a society. And we hear all the time, every time there's a pandemic, we hear about typhoid Marys. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving on to, uh, uh, to, to Dr. Edward. Dr. Edward, uh, this question is in regards to the relationship of uh, designating hot zones and the idea of a super spreader. Uh, Neighborhoods in Canada with higher proportions of residents belonging to groups designated as visible minorities have experienced greater COVID-19 related mortality rates, about two times higher than neighborhoods with low proportions of visible minority residents. How can these hot zones impact the assimilation of immigrants into wider society? Is it plausible to assume that the spatial partitioning as a response to COVID-19 can promote the idea of ethnic enclaves? And are immigrants more likely to be perceived as super spreaders than non-immigrants? Uh, super spreader phenomenon, like, um, yeah, it's, it's not uh, just uh, in, in residential uh, place, but it can be at workplace. Eh? So I don't know how, um, like, so like, it's not um, just one dimension. Uh, and I, I don't know what you mean by um, spatial partitioning. Are you saying that um, possible policy would be to confine certain ethnic groups to certain areas such as so as to create more ethnic enclaves? Uh, what, I, what I mean by spatial partitioning is uh, that individuals, families have been separated from collective society by partitioning them, confining them to their own homes, uh, which uh, if we translate that into the idea of a neighborhood where visible minorities or racialized communities or immigrants in fact live, uh, it could be said that uh, it is a kind of a spatial partitioning. And uh, since it has been found that neighborhoods in Canada with higher proportions of residents belonging to visible minorities have an increased mortality rate, uh, it, it makes me wonder if uh, the idea of a hot zone can be equated with the idea of a super spreader. I'd like to take uh, your opinion on it too, Dr. Walt. Yeah, and, and I don't think um partitioning ethnic groups uh, spatially would be the policy direction. Uh, and uh, like as, as we see right now is um, the uh, importance of a non-pharmaceutical intervention and more recently pharmaceutical in intervention by way of uh, uh, encouraging people to be vaccinated, they are the preferred policy. Like there's no policy to further segregate people into different neighborhoods. That's not, unless like it, like you talk about quarantine uh, thing after uh, uh, arriving back to Canada. Yeah, that's, but that's not social petitioning, yeah. I would say, I mean, I, again, I really, I'm sorry, but I, I can't help it. Um, I really wanna uh, underscore that we're talking about racial, racialized pop, uh, populations. Mm -hmm. 
So when you use the term immigrant, um, you know, as Dr. Ng is saying, um, we, immigrant can be a lot of people, Americans, uh, US Americans who flee to Canada because they don't like the US government or something like that. And I have a lot of friends who have done that, um, the previous administration, um, that you know they would be considered immigrants and yet they're college professors and they are, um, they are not impoverished and they, are, they have access to excellent healthcare. So we're really talking about different things. But I think what you're talking about when you talk about it, it's not so much that a government is gonna confine them, but that the spaces in which those groups live become pathologized. They become, as you say, hot zones. They become seen as dangerous because of who inhabits them. And it, get bl it gets blamed on the inhabitants. And this is the uh, analogous to what I was describing from the Newsweek piece, rather than getting blamed on poverty and getting blamed on racism and getting blamed on uh, populations that don't have access to state-of-the-art healthcare, that don't have um, perhaps as good um, access to clean water and air or um, room to, to get away. I mean, one of the reasons I think the US, there were many reasons that the US had a much worse uh, rate of COVID spread than Canada, but one of them was crowding. That, you know, there were there is a larger population that lives in more concentrated areas. So if you can't get away to your country house, you're going to be more susceptible to illness. And Dr. N, Dr. N also talked about um, the um, frontline workers and who were frontline workers. You know, and there's one thing about frontline workers in a hospital, but what about farm workers? What about people in grocery stores? What about people in meatpacking plants? All of those people are disproportionately economically disadvantaged. And that, at least in the US and I think in Canada, also correlates with race. So in all of those ways, the system that is responsible for this is instead putting the blame on the people who are suffering from that uh, set of, of um, circumstances very well that they are not causing. And since we're very short on time, uh, uh, the last question that I'd like to address uh, is whether you are familiar with Arthur Schopenhauer's porcupine dilemma. And uh, do you think it's an accurate representation of the problem of communicable disease? And uh, do you have a word of advice uh, for immigrants? I know about it only from um, today. I had to Google it from your mm -hmm. questions. And my answer is, um, I don't want to try to explain it except to say that from what I gathered on Wikipedia, it has to do with um, hedgehogs trying to keep warm in a freeze and they huddle together, but they have porcupines and so they can't huddle together. And it's about people being dangerous to each other and therefore um, needing to modify their behavior. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is um, I have my own version of that, which I think is a little bit less um, pessimistic maybe. Mm -hmm. um, my version of this is that contagion is an analog for what it means to be human. We are social beings. And one of the things this pandemic has shown us is that we need each other. We give each other really good things, which is not part of the porcupine metaphor. I think it's really important to start there. Very positive effects on each other. We are social beings, we need each other. But what contagion also tells us is that we're also dangerous to each other. And we frequently, typically, one hopes, don't mean to be, right? That, you know, if I'm carrying a disease, I don't know I'm carrying it, I don't want to make you sick, but unfortunately, um, that might happen. And so uh, as an analog um, for uh, what it means to be human, I think what contagion does tell us, and here I may dovetail a bit with the hedgehog porcupine or whatever it is, not hedgehog, I think, well, both, um, be, is be. that either, right? They were both, um, is that we should, this is why masking was so important because putting on the mask protected us, but much more, it protected other people. And this is why I was very happy to wear my mask. If anyone asked me to put it on, I will happily put on my mask because the worst thing I can do is make someone else sick. I don't wanna do that. Just as I don't drive drunk, um, I'm very careful as a driver. I worry all the time about inadvertently, un, un, you know, not by choice, 
hurting people and I want to do everything I can not to. And that's yeah. part of being a social being. So I, I have a more positive version than okay. the porcupine example, but it's similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so okay. so um, my, um, my role as um, a spokesperson for uh, like, um, in a sense, Stascan uh, is not to talk about policy. Uh, so, so that's why I mean, I, I think, uh, so immigrants, uh, like we, we follow the direction from uh, public health authorities, uh, the, the non-pharmaceutical instruction and the pharmaceutical instruction. And then I, I in terms of immigrants, I, I know that um, like uh, in some of the so-called hotspots, like for example, in uh, Brampton, um, the immigrant population, the, the ethnic organizations play an important role to mobilize the population to follow those instructions, to be vaccinated, to follow the public health guidelines. So, so the, the immigrant groups work together to reduce uh, COVID uh, infection and rates. So that would be my uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you both for, uh, for your time. It was an honor for Canadian Immigration News to host you.